Good morning, everyone. I'm Adam White, a resident scholar at the American Enterprise Institute. And it's my pleasure this morning to welcome you to a conversation on the American presidency and our constitution and in our politics. Our featured guest today is my friend and colleague, John Yu, a visiting scholar here at AEI and the University of California, Berkeley's Emanuel S. Heller Professor of Law. John served in all three branches of the federal government, in the Justice Department's Office of Legal Counsel, in the Senate Judiciary Committee, and at the Supreme Court as a clerk to Justice Clarence Thomas. His previous books include Crisis and Command, A History of Executive Power from George Washington to George W. Bush. And his newest book, the subject of today's discussion, is titled Defender in Chief, Donald Trump's Fight for Presidential Power. John, thanks for joining us today. Oh, thanks, Adam, and thanks to AEI wife, it's hard to believe I've been a scholar here for almost 20 years. I think I'm one of the oldest people on the staff. It's great to uh, be here again to talk about a book, and it wouldn't be possible without having uh, relationships like the ones I have at AEI. Terrific, John. Let's, let's jump into the book. At the end of the book's introduction, uh, you summarize the overall um, argument and theme of the book. You say that President Trump, quote, has returned to the framer's original vision of the presidency as an office of unity, vigor, and independence. And in securing the benefits of an energetic executive for his successors, Trump may have done the nation his greatest service. So why don't you elaborate on that and describe uh, the overall argument in the book? Thanks, thanks. I was like, boy, that's great writing. Now, I was like, gosh, I should have taken one third of the words out of that long, long sentence. Uh, no, I, but it's a fair summary of the book. And I got to say, when uh, Trump ran for president in 2016, I was wary of him. I, well, he wasn't my first pick for president. And one reason I was wary of him is because he's a populist. And the Constitution actually fears populists. And you, you think about populists in the past, like an FDR and Andrew Jackson, even Abraham Lincoln, there are people who think they have the popular will behind them. And the Constitution is often seen as an obstacle, particularly true of people like FDR. And so you would have thought President Trump would come into office and he would find the Constitution a hindrance, an obstacle to what he wanted to do. But instead, the last three and a half, four years, what I've seen is that's his opponents who really want to upend and change constitutional traditions and institutions. It's his opponents, as I go through, who want to get rid of the Electoral College. It's his opponents who want to pack the Supreme Court from nine to 16 members, which I think would be terrible for judicial independence and the rule of law. They're the ones who support the idea of using special counsels and prosecutors to fight our partisan political battles or support the idea of an independent bureaucracy like the FBI and Jim Comey who can decide who's fit or not fit to hold the office, not the voters, or who want to nationalize the economy and create right, this vague Green New Deal in the service of global warming. And so the thing, that's why I said almost in a way, he's, Trump has become the most surprising defender of the Constitution, because even though he's a populist, he's turned out to be the one who's defending, I think, more often than fighting with traditional constitutional understandings, our institutions. That's not to say he hasn't really changed, which he has, the norms and the politics of the office of the president. But I think when it comes to constitutional powers, he's actually not been this great destroyer, this great shredder of the Constitution uh, of which he's been accused so often by his critics. Well, in the opening chapters, especially, you point to the conflicts between President Trump and, and some of his critics, some of his opponents. You begin with the very beginning with his election and the nature of the Electoral Council. But let's jump to chapter two, where you describe uh, a president's duty to take care that the laws are faithfully executed and, and what that means for President Trump's relationship to law enforcement. Uh, you, yeah. you mentioned the, the, the case of, of his conflict with James Comey. I, that's great, because, because I think the founders thought the two most important functions of the presidency, they say so right in the Federalist Papers, was uh, one, protecting the country, protecting the national security, and then two, enforcing the law. They wanted the, the president to be independent of Congress because they thought having congressional control of law enforcement, as Montesquieu put it, was the very definition of tyranny. So Trump comes in the office, and one way I understand the Mueller investigation, one way I understand what happened with Jim Comey was almost a revolt of the law enforcement bureaucracy. Oh, wait, look, I used to be part of it in the Bush administration. I was in the Justice Department too. But you had this, I think, this revolt by the, the FBI and the headquarters staff and Jim Comey 
ultimately, that the against the elected leadership of the country, against the person that the American people chose to be in charge of law enforcement. Constitution says it's the president that take care of that the laws are faithfully executed. And under our system, I think again, this is the traditional understanding, President Trump has the right to fire not just Jim Comey, but anyone involved in law enforcement, because as the Supreme Court has long said, all those people are assistants to the president in performing his constitutional responsibility to take care that the laws are faithfully executed. So rather than seeing some great constitutional disaster in Trump firing Comey, what I argue is that it was the president here, Trump, restoring the traditional executive control of law enforcement through the power to remove anybody who's involved with prosecution or investigation, because they are all people who have to help the president in achieving that duty to take care of the laws are faithfully executed. It's the sort of issue I suppose that Justice Scalia grappled with in his famous dissent in Morrison versus Olson, where he said to those who think that the president shouldn't be in full control of law enforcement, uh, the only thing worse than that perhaps would be the president not having full control and having something as important as the prosecutorial power or law enforcement power scattered among a variety of offices that aren't actually accountable to the people through the president. He has a great line in that dissent to Morrison where he says uh, about the independent counsel, he says, sometimes a wolf comes disguised in sheep's clothing, but this time the wolf comes disguised as a wolf. But there's even a bigger, and this is not even really discussed in Morrison, but the bigger issue of political theory, which I know a lot of AEI people are interested in, is that the independent counsel also represents, I say, the pinnacle of the idea of the administrative state. The idea that, and this is really Woodrow Wilson's idea, maybe some of Teddy Roosevelt's idea of FDRs, the idea that the you know, our former president, Chris DeMuth, was really interested in these issues. The idea that uh, public policy questions were not about politics. They were scientific, managerial issues. So even prosecution is up to the experts. And so you should create special counsels who are insulated and protected from politics so they can do their professional jobs. They can do their expert witness, ex, I'm sorry, ex, expert functions. Um, I just want to, oh, go ahead, go ahead, John, please. I just said that runs contrary, I think, to this idea that the Constitution creates a direct political control over law enforcement. The founders, I think, would not have accepted this idea that public policy questions are just questions of technical expertise alone, but that, you know, we are the voters, we elect a president, and that president is the one who's in charge of law enforcement, and then we hold him responsible or her accountable for those policies at the next election. Uh, I just want to tell the audience, by the way, that if you have questions you want to submit for the audience Q&A portion of today's discussion, you can send them in two ways. You can either submit your questions on Twitter at hashtag Defender in Chief, or you can send, in by, send them by email uh, to the program director for AEI's uh, Department of Social, Cultural, and Constitutional Studies, Nicole Penn. That's Nicole, N-I-C-O-L-E dot Penn, P-E-N-N, at A-E-I dot org. John, on this point, you were just um, elaborating on the political accountability of the president and this tension between that accountability and technical expertise. That's a theme that runs not through, not just through your first chapter, sorry, your, your discussion on law enforcement, but then on these broader questions of bureaucracy and the president, his conflicts with the State Department, his, con his conflicts with uh, the national uh, intelligence apparatus of the country and, and so on, that this is not just limited to law enforcement, this is a broader challenge in governance, the president and the bureaucracy that he's elected to lead. I know, and these are questions you and I, you and I, Adam, are both interested in, which is, and I think it really expresses to not just Trump fighting to win his battles every day, but expresses this conflict between two different visions of government. And I think Trump is trying to return us back, even he may not even realize he's doing it or consciously doing it, but his own self-interest causes him to want to bring us back to that more Spartan limited idea of the government that the founders had, the idea that the branches would be separate, that they wouldn't cooperate all the time, that they would be constantly fighting. And that's how individual liberty would result. Instead, you have this other vision, this progressive vision of cooperation between the branches. And why can't they get over the separation of powers by creating this administrative state? And that administrative
administrative state is going to be filled with permanent bureaucrats with expertise who are going to constantly be creating new laws and adjudicating, constantly growing and acting in government, which is, again, I think the opposite of the 18th century constitution. The other uh, point I just throw in there is I think Trump, interestingly, uh, right, he's pursuing his political self-interest. Obviously, when he fights with Mueller, Comey, when he fights on impeachment, he's trying to save his political hide. Uh, what I'd like is what I try to argue in the book, though, is that uh, the Founders' Constitution tries to channel that rational self-interest into a greater constitutional good by hopefully causing all these competing interests into fighting each other, right? Madison's famous phrase, phrase ambition must counteract ambition, right? The interests of the man should become the interest of the place, which means his institutions. And that by that constant struggle that government, that will limit government more effectively than the Bill of Rights and than courts. And that space that's left without government will be where our individual liberties are. You know, I don't know if Trump knows he's doing that or thinks he's doing that, but I think the Constitution, by channeling Trump's self-interest, tries to so In many ways, it's kind of like uh, the free markets, another 18th century idea around the time of the 1770s. Well, yeah, I suppose the part of our system is the fact that President, no president is supposed to be necessarily a constitutional scholar. Um, rather, the president occupies. I, I hope. I hope not. <laughs> like, that's, right, last, that's right. The last one we really had was uh, Woodrow Wilson. <laughs> Look what right. He did. <laughs> right. I mean, well, I mean, th th that's right. And 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 so you have a president who's exercising an office, occupying an office, and his ambition is channeled through that office and attached to the office the same way that the ambitions of say members of Congress are channeled into their offices and and our system presumes that the they will duke it out so to speak through politics and that that is how sort of these institutional values are are, are advanced and achieved um, you, you 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 go on to describe it's an interesting term you call it the president's power to reverse and and I suppose it's it's that in a system where presidents have vast powers, not just through the from the Constitution, but through the panoply of statutes that have been delegated, that have delegated powers to administrations over a century or more, um, that the president is an immensely consequential policymaking position, and therefore we need to leave maximum space for each president to move forward after an election and, and reverse policies of his of the, the previous administration you write about that and 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 we've both written a little bit about the ways that that's it bumped up against the courts in this administration so why don't you tell us about the power to reverse and how it's fared in, in the trump administration so i it's a great point adam that you make and, and i hope i bring out some of the stuff that we've both done on this topic but i think i tr was trying to explain how one of the real limitations on the presidency but also one of the president's powers is this power to reverse we don't really think of it that way. Uh, you know, when Congress wants to repeal a law, it passes a new law. Supreme Courts, once decisions are reversed, they're reversed by other Supreme Court decisions. We really ask that much about, well, how does a president change policy? It's just sort of obvious, you would think. Well, the president just reverses what the last president did in the same way by issuing an executive order or firing somebody or pardoning someone. In fact, if you look at the formal powers of the president, a lot of them have to do with reversing what the last president did. But then to apply it to Trump, it seems that Trump really likes to use those powers, right? His favorite tagline is, you're fired. If you think about firing, it is a reversal of a joint decision by the president and the Senate who shall hold an office. He's also terminated treaties. He pulled us out of the Iran deal. He pulled us out of the Paris Global Warming Accords. He's now been pulling us out of, I think, by uh, becoming somewhat obsolete, these bilateral arms control treaties with the former Soviet Union, now Russia. Uh, you could say Trump's almost favorite executive power is this power, to, and of course, pardoning. Uh, but the fate of it is interesting, Adam, because I would have thought this would have been an obvious aspect of the executive power. But as you know, in the Supreme Court three weeks ago, in the DAGA decision, I, I was quite astounded. I think the Supreme Court said, no, actually, the president doesn't have this kind of immediate reversal power. Think about what DACA did. I, I, I actually think DACA as a policy idea is a good idea, but the Constitution clearly says immigration law is under the control of Congress. Congress has not created a category for the dreamers or their parents to stay in the country. The president has a power to and the duty 
executing to take care of the laws are faithfully executed. Nevertheless, President Obama said, I'm going to create a DACA program just by not enforcing the immigration laws against the class that ranges anywhere from two to six million people. It seems to me President Trump, upon taking office, has the power of reversal. He can say, no, I'm going to start enforcing those laws again. What was remarkable, I think, was that the Supreme Court then said, no, President Trump, you have to follow the Administrative Procedure Act, you know, which can take anywhere from one to four years to use, to undo President Obama's decision, even though President Obama didn't use the Administrative Procedure Act. He just said, I'm using my discretion over prosecution. So one thing uh, I've been asking, and I started asking that actually back in 2012 when President Obama issued DACA, which is, well, if this power of non-enforcement is true, if the Supreme Court now believes what it says, well, think of all the things President Trump can do. And it'll take his successor two or three years to undo that. President Trump could really radically change immigration law. He could say, well, I'm not going to enforce the immigration laws against people who get PhDs in computer science or mathematics from American universities, or people who bring millions of dollars and invest them in American businesses. He could just create his own DACA program, just search for place uh, children and parents of children with STEM degrees or assets or skills, certain skills. I hope, uh, I think the Supreme Court was wrong, but I don't see why there should be some special constitutional law of presidential power that limits Trump, of limits Trump. Well, on the other hand, the Supreme Court should apply a completely different rule that only benefits other presidents. Yeah, and, and your argument on this, it comes back to the take care clause of the Constitution. Right. You say at one point you wrote the book, obviously, before the court decided that case a few weeks ago. Um, uh, but with, you wrote it with an eye to that case, knowing that it was on its way. Uh, and you said uh, it cannot be the case that the courts can force a president to continue. This is uh, in your book. It cannot be the case that the courts can force a president to continue to enforce a policy that he believes to be and in fact is unconstitutional. So it's ultimately a, a, an argument from presidential duty and power. Yeah, that, that is actually, I think, the bigger issue behind even the DACA issue, which the court itself doesn't talk about. But I think if there's one thing which unifies the Roberts Court, it is this self-confidence in judicial supremacy, that it knows best what the Constitution means. And its view of the Constitution is superior to that of the president or Congress. Right? This would have come as a shock to the founders, where if you look at the beginnings of the country, it is the president and it is the Congress that resolve a lot of the major constitutional issues in the beginning, not the yeah. Supreme Court. And if you think about the result of DACA, you have a president, President Trump comes to office, immediately he says DACA is unconstitutional. I think he's right about that. It's up to Congress to pass DACA. He should be able to say, I am not going to enforce this unconstitutional policy. That's the only reason I need to end DACA. And yet now, as you say, in result, what has happened is the Supreme Court has ordered President Trump to keep enforcing an unconstitutional policy, not just that Trump believes is unconstitutional, but the lower courts have found unconstitutional too. I think it's quite remarkable. It's actually quite, you know, yet another example of this seizure from the political branches, from the president and Congress of their right to interpret the constitution by the courts. And, and it's not a partisan thing. It's not a conservative liberal thing. All the justices love to do this <laughs> when it suits them. Yeah, I, you know, I wrote a little bit about this um, yeah. after uh, both the book, the book was coming out and you wrote some more about it in National Review. And for me, this particular issue seemed sort of a, a, a consequence of the Administrative Procedure Act, which is in and of itself a, a, a broad overlay on executive power, which raises, you know, in, you know, challenging questions. It always has about the extent to which either Congress can legislate procedures upon the president or that the courts can enforce those legislative procedures. But in describe, the way you described this conflict between um, the Trump administration and, and the Roberts court, um, it actually brings me back to an earlier point where you talked about the branches you know, having ambition and checking and balancing one another. How should these sorts of moments play out when a, an ambitious president is, is, finds himself bumping up against what may be a, an ambitious court of a sort? It's interesting, you know, this is, uh, I think, something that actually divides Trump from his critics. The critics would say, well, the answer is, let's add six new justices to the court then, if we don't like what it's doing, uh, which I think would do a lot to 
undermine judicial independence and the rule of law. And there's a proposal that's been rejected in the past, most famously when FDR tried to pack the court to get it to accept the New Deal. And he failed on that, although he did succeed in his goal of causing the court to switch course. Uh, I think what President Trump has been doing is more, again, the traditional approach, which is gradually trying to change the direction of the court by putting new judges on. Trump didn't say, let's expand the Supreme Court to 11 or 12 people. Uh, he just, tra the tradition, he replaced the vacancies that occurred on his presidency with Neil Gorsuch and Brett Kavanaugh. And he picked people who were conservative, who shared his judicial ideology. Actually, the, a, a remarkable thing, we talk a little bit about in the book, is President Trump's the first one to issue a list of names and say, I will only pick from this list of names. And to actually almost delegate the power to come up with the list to well-known conservative groups like the Heritage Foundation and the Federal Society. Adam, I don't know how we got shut out of that at AEI. I mean, how come, or Hoover, how come we didn't get asked to participate? But right, Trump did that all publicly because he wanted to show a commitment to judicial ideology of a certain kind because he'd never had public office. He had no track record uh, on judges. But again, the but, and he has filled the lower courts. I think sometimes that goes unnoticed by the American people. He has filled the lower courts with a lot of very young, committed originalists, very aggressive, actually, publicly well-known in their communities, uh, lawyers and uh, judges who seem to share a commitment to interpreting the Constitution based on its original understanding. So again, yes, Trump has had these conflicts with the courts, but he hasn't tried to do anything radical with regard to the courts, he has followed what presidents since at least Nixon, if not before, have done, which is just to gradually change the personnel in the direction that he wants. And then, as you point, also Congress and the Senate can oppose him. Right? They don't have to confirm any of these nominees if they don't want to. But Trump is at the benefit of a Republican Senate during his presidency. Yeah, this is a, a point you you go on uh, in detail in the book. The way that President Trump. Has, is going to have a long legacy, both in the judges that he's appointed, um, especially because a lot of them are very, very young, and, and, and also um, the legacy of transforming Supreme Court politics um, it, through the, the, the list, right? Laying down a marker in advance and committing not just to a certain kind of judge, or often candidates would say judges like Scalia or, or, and Thomas, but actually naming names when it comes to a Supreme Court, um, possible Supreme Court nomination. It'll be interesting to see whether Vice President Biden and the current presidential campaign try something similar or uh, um, if future Republican nominees do. But I'm curious now that we've gotten on this subject, on the whole, is that, is that approach, the, the, the list, is, it's not without cost, right? Because on the one hand, it, it, it elevates the issue and gives some certainty to the public that they know what they're getting with the president and his Supreme Court nominees. Um, on the other hand, creating a list could create you know, interesting politics around the list, right? It might be a temptation for judges to do things to try to get themselves on the list, to try to get themselves above other people on the list. I guess since you wrote about it in the book, what do you think is the long-term future for these, these Supreme Court lists? That's a good question. You could say the downside is you might uh, treat judges like uh, legislation, right? That they, they are just uh, certain outcomes. And what you're voting for, what uh, the presidents are saying they're going to do is just appoint people who are going to vote a certain way. And I just saw Senator Hawley said he's going to apply a litmus test from now on and only vote for people who are opposed to Roe versus Wade, for example. And there are plenty of people on the Democratic side who say they will never vote for someone who's not in favor of Roe versus Wade. Uh, so you could say, oh, uh, you know, we don't want judicial appointments to just treat judges like, a, I don't know, a bundle of votes with their outcomes. What we are voting for are people with a certain approach to interpreting the law. So I guess so totally see that downside. I think it really, the upside is really because of President Trump's unique nature and that he had no background. I think people might forget now how important that list was in his winning the nomination. I think the polls of something like 25% of the people who voted for Trump only voted for him, only supported him because of the Supreme Court issue. Remember, there was an open vacancy at the time right. of the election because of Justice Scalia. Also, remember, he was in a dogfight with Ted Cruz for the nomination. And of course, a lot of conservatives would trust Ted Cruz to appoint good people. He's, he himself was a Supreme Court clerk. He was Solicitor General of Texas 
was a constitutional conservative before it was cool. Trump had to make that public commitment because he needed to right, show his own bona fides to show that he could be trusted on the judicial issue. It may not be the case that you would need any future candidates who have a lengthy record and who right, have a practice in the history of appointing judges and have spoken on constitutional issues uh, to do something uh, like that again. And that's why I, said, I just thought it was remarkable. Uh, I don't know if it's a good uh, practice. For example, I don't know what you think, Adam. I wouldn't say a president should campaign and say, well, here's the short list for secretary of defense. Secretary, you know, you could think of why not do it for every office? Why make it just the Supreme Court? I'm not so sure that's a good idea either because presidents need that flexibility in how they run the uh, government. You don't want it to be a coalition. You could easily turn, see it turning into a, like a coalition government where different interests in the party, right? Try to say, we're not going to support you unless you pick from our list for secretary of education or something. And I would yeah. say that would be something the framers would have worried about. They didn't want the presidency to be a kind of parliamentary coalition executive the way we see in our Western European uh, peer countries. Right, and also they expected the Senate to play some sort of role Hamilton writes about it in Federal 76 as sort of a silent check in the background. And, and so I suppose you'd want a president to actually come to office at least with most of his, you know, big appointments, you know, bring them to the Senate for a real process of, of Senate advice and consent to give those offices some some legitimacy beyond just the ballot box. Although there's something to be said for making clear to the voters, you know, what your administration is going to look like. I'm trying. To, I'm thinking back to George W. Bush, right? His his addition, not just to Vice President Cheney, obviously as his running mate, but but people knowing that Colin Powell was was likely to be Secretary of State was no small thing for a president who really didn't have any experience on the global stage. Um, but I digress. What, one of the great challenges of politics these days, and you touch on it in your book, is the clash of, of almost um, unlimited powers. You know, each branch has within itself powers that are not easy to check, um, or the, the powers that at least can do a lot, can have a big impact before they're checked, right? We saw that with the House with impeachment. Right, where the, the House, whether, regardless of what happens with a Senate impeachment trial, the House's ability to impeach a president um, is pretty open-ended. At the same time, uh, the president has very open-ended powers with respect to pardons, commutations, and, and so on. We touched on this a little bit in our discussion of, of prosecutorial power and prosecutorial discretion and that quote from Scalia about you know, entrusting this totally to the executive branch how should we think about those sorts of powers that the president can wield without any real check or balance, and especially that pardon power, which has been in the news a little bit lately. And if this proves to be President Trump's term, will probably be in the news at the end of his term like it is for the end of every presidential term. <laughs> yeah, it's true. And I think that's a really good point, Adam. There are certain powers inherent in each branch that define that branch, which uh, the framers did not give any other outside branch a role in, and perhaps we don't want them to. You could say the judiciary's power to decide cases, who wins and who loses a case. You know, Congress's power to legislate. And then as you say, the executive's power to choose who to prosecute or not prosecute, who to pardon, how to execute the law, how to protect the country's national security. So yeah, you're right, you're quite, it's a really good point. You see that in area after area. I think sometimes people expect the constitution to save us that they think not only does the constitution distribute and allocate those powers, but then somehow the constitution is going to prevent abuse of those powers or how you just use those powers we happen to disagree with. Uh, for example, so after the pardon of uh, a commutation of Roger Stone recently, Nancy Pelosi, I think gave a lot of uh, voice that she said, well, Congress is gonna pass a law to make sure that can't ever happen in the future. Well, that's actually not possible. You know, Congress can't limit the party power in that way. Uh, the Supreme Court has said so uh, several times before. So what is the, as you say, what is the limit on abuse? Well, as you say, for example, presidential power ultimately is, is subject to impeachment. Uh, the president can be removed uh, if the House and Senate agree. And to prevent that from becoming a partisan tool, of course, the framers set the removal bar very high at two thirds. But this is the thing, I think that if you look at the founding debates, they really expected the check on abuse of constitutional power to be politics. I so suppose, for example, we we're talking about this with foreign policy this week. Uh, President Trump has been floating the idea of reducing the troop presence in Germany or withdrawing troops from the Middle 
Middle East from uh, Afghanistan. And Congress, Congress can't command the troops, but they can use their own constitutional powers to try to frustrate the president, right? They can attach spending conditions. They can, uh, they have the power to set the size of the military and its capabilities. I think that's what the founders expected, not taking it to the Supreme Court, which seems to be everybody's preference these days, or not claiming the constitution says exactly who gets to decide where troops are gonna be stationed. I think what they thought, again, going back to this Madisonian idea of uh, the branches checking each other, achieving a kind of greater balance, that system has to work by the, each Congress, the president, the judiciary, using those powers that are given, as you described, Adam, against each other to pursue their interests. And yes, they might fight and check each other, but that's all gonna be the realm of politics. It's not going to be one filled with correct and clear constitutional uh, rules that we can draw from the text. And sometimes I think today we just expect, oh, the constitution is gonna save us, the Supreme Court will decide everything. I, I really don't think that is what the founders intended. And so that's why I kind of argue in a way, Trump is bringing us back to that more original understanding because he is very vigorous about using the powers of his office to try to fight and frustrate uh, Congress. And, and for a lot of those powers, most of them, um, they're subject to reversal. Like you said, there's the president has the power to reverse, but that means for each president, there's a natural limitation on himself. It's the, mm -hmm. it's the, the possibility of being reversed. Mm -hmm. And so sometimes these things um, sort themselves out uh, over time. I want to remind people, uh, we'll go to audience questions in just a few minutes. Um, you can send questions on Twitter at hashtag Defender in Chief or by email to Nicole, uh, N-I-C-O-L-E dot pen, P-E-N-N at A-E-I uh, dot org. John, you say at the, in the closing part of the book with, with an eye towards the upcoming presidential election, you say to make the case for another term, President Trump will have to use the Constitution more as a sword to advance his positive agenda. I'm looking ahead to, to the ways in which presidential power, executive and administrative power can help promote an affirmative policy agenda. What sorts of things could President Trump uh, do uh, to, help, um, to help move those balls forward in the interest of reelection? Yeah, I think uh, much of the book seems almost defensive because I think Trump has been using the constitution more as a shield to protect himself from uh, attack. So yeah, look at a second and what could he do? I think uh, one of the, I think great successes until uh, the pandemic came along was the rejuvenation of the economy, faster rates of economic growth, consumer spending, investment. And I think, yes, tax cuts had something to do with it, but the president's power reversal through deregulation was an important aspect of that. And, you know, sometimes the administration used, I think, clumsy rules to do that, saying, oh, to, uh, you know, to get a new regulation passed, an agency has to get rid of another regulation. Uh, and now I think that ratio might even be three to one right, in, in practice. But, you know, a, an, an effort to sort of really focus on relieving the burdens of government on the economy to really deregulate seriously. I think Trump has had a lot of success, but it hasn't really been able to really take off, I think, uh, in the way it could with a kind of sustained effort in a second term. Another thing where you could see presidential power uh, really changing things would be in foreign policy. I think actually foreign policy was part of the, some of the hardest parts of the book to write because even though the president's constitutional authorities are at their height in foreign policy, it was hard to uh, figure out what the Trump doctrine was. You know, was it really just sort of ping-ponging around from issue to issue, controversy to controversy, or some larger vision at stake? And here I thought there's something uh, that is uh, that connects immigration and foreign policy, but has a constitutional root, which is this desire to restore American sovereignty. Uh, right? The idea that the United States is a, na a normal nation state it controls its borders, it decides who comes in and out of the country, but it also should pursue a rational national self-interest. And part of that means maybe we can't afford to provide security for every place in the world, but it also means taking seriously threats from other nation states. And I think uh, uh, you know, Trump has been using his constitutional powers to try to reorient our security, to take note of the rise of China. I think, it's, I think it's hard to, it's, it's, it's maybe because we lived through it, but it's hard to believe how different are the uh, 
view of Washington was of China just three, four years ago. And I think this has been a bipartisan effort. I think this is one of the parties seem to agree and the president and Congress seem to agree. And I think that really is because of President Trump using his constitutional powers. So I think that's gonna be another area where in a second term, you would really see then where uh, Trump could really pursue an agenda about how to contain and confront China, not, even, not going to war, but using his powers as commander chief over diplomacy to try to build alliances, to contain China, to address Russia and Iran. Presidents in second terms often look to foreign affairs for successes too. And I would think Trump probably wouldn't be that different. Um, you mentioned uh, his work on the economy and how it was interrupted by the COVID-19 outbreak. Maybe I guess that'll be my last question then is, as we've watched President Trump um, and his administration um, cooperate with and sometimes clash with state and local governments, uh, cooperate with, sometimes clash with, with Congress. How should we think about the experience, both what we've already gone through and what will come next in, in the COVID-19 uh, struggle? How, how does that, uh, what lessons does that teach us about President Trump and the constitutional presidency? Yeah, it's interesting, again, I think Trump has been respectful of the constitution. It's not really the president's powers that are at stake here. It's uh, the balance between the federal and state governments, what we call federalism, not the separation of powers. And on this issue, it's, it's both uh, at stake with the pandemic, but also with the disorder we're seeing in some of the cities today. Uh, the Constitution creates a federal government of narrow, limited, enumerated powers. And it's the states that exercise most of the, what we call the police power. They're the ones that are in charge of public health and safety, both responding to a pandemic or responding to civil disorder in their streets. The federal government can provide assistance, right? It can provide masks, it can provide money, it can provide research. Uh, but, the, but the power of deciding whether everyone has to wear a mask or deciding whether businesses should close and open, that's the states. And Trump had a lot of people yelling at him saying, why don't you shut all the businesses down? Why don't you, right? make everyone wear a mask. And he properly said, that's not the federal government's job. We can support and we can guide, but it's really the states have to be responsible. Now that could be, uh, that could cripple his reelection because the flip side of that is the reopening of the economy is also up to the states. In a way, President Trump's economic fate is in the hands of blue state governors like Newsom or Cuomo, because they're the ones who are gonna decide how fast the economy opens. The federal government can't force every business open in the country because there's one limited power. So the same goes with the disorder. The federal government can send troops to protect or law enforcement to protect federal buildings, to enforce federal laws about organized crime or guns or drugs. But the federal government doesn't have any larger role just maintaining peace and safety in the streets unless, and I hope it doesn't come to this, but unless cities and states are incapable or unwilling to protect the constitutional rights of their citizens uh, and maintaining law and order. Only in that you know, limited area, again, can the United States send law enforcement or send troops into the cities. What, 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 would, what sort of thing would qualify for that last category? <laughs> that's, a, that's a hard question. You can look yeah. at historically how it's happened. You know, the Rodney King riots uh, in 1992, uh, you know, you can look in the recon. You know, you can look at the, um, desegregation, of course, and yeah. and the riots that occurred after the assassination of Martin Luther King and Bobby Kennedy. Or you could go even farther back. I think people forget maybe the Reconstruction experience, where some Southern states you know, would step aside and let the Ku Klux Klan attack the freed slaves and deprive them of their constitutional rights. And it was uh, the oft-criticized President Grant and the Ku Klux Klan Act of 1875 that was used, right, to send federal troops to intervene to protect the constitutional rights of the citizens when state and local governments do aside. But you know, the courts have never weighed in really about what constitutes the sufficient grounds to send uh, forces. And that's always, again, and maybe that's a lesson of the book, it's always been up to politics, right? We have a basis in the constitution, but it's up to those branches to interpret the constitution. We should expect this is all something that the courts should decide for us. Uh, here's our first audience question, John. It comes from Paul Taylor, and it, it, uh, he, he writes, anyone who runs for president has to have a big ego. President Trump is no different, but his ego seems to make him remarkably resistant to changing his views 
in order to assuage the politically correct popular mood of the moment, at least the mood among political, legal, and media elites. Paul continues, do you think a politically incorrect president like that is just what the modern presidency needs to restore the authority of the president? And do you think that the overreaching and flawed responses by President Trump's critics serve to further highlight the need for a president with full constitutional powers? That's a really interesting question because it uh, sort of connects the part of the office I didn't write about, which is the politics of the office. You know, as, you know whereas I argue that President Trump has really been trying to fight to keep the presidency intact, return us to the presidency the founders had in mind. It's hard to figure out exactly how does that connect to the political aspect of the office. And I would be the first to admit, President Trump has done a lot to change some of the norms of the way presidents act, his attitude and approach to the media, for example, the way he sort of continues to fight with individuals and even organizations as uh, president. He can't restrain himself. Uh, you know, uh, maybe Paul Taylor's question there is also reflected that you know Trump seems to think right sh changing one's mind is a sign of weakness and uh, sticking to a consistent uh, argument is a sign of strength. I guess one thing that you and I am talking about, though, is that the Constitution does make it possible for the president to switch grounds quickly because of this power reversal. It's, uh, it used to be, until the Supreme Court's DACA opinion, hard to lock in presidential policy. There wasn't this one-way ratchet where you could, a uh, president could do something and it couldn't be easily changed if the circumstances dictated. And so I, I, I do take uh, Paul's point about uh, Trump trying to be consistent. Um, at the same time, I think the founders wanted the president to be nimble and quick acting. I think they saw the branch that was going to be more consistent and uh, changing its mind less would be Congress. You look at you know, Congress, you pass a law, it's extremely hard to undo a law because of the presidential veto and the filibuster. Uh, so it's hard for Congress to undo what it does. But I think the president, that's the branch that the Founders wanted to have a certain quickness, nimbleness to respond to changing circumstances. And so I hope that you know, President Trump realizes that, that yes, he should stick to his uh, principles, keep his promises. He does seem to think that's important. We talked about on the Supreme Court list is definitely an example of keeping his promise. But they also, the founders wanted the president, and I hope Trump understands that, to be able to switch quickly in direction if change circumstances required. In fact, they're the only branch compared to Congress and the judiciary that exists all the time to defend the country in face of unexpected occurrences and changing circumstances. But a president can sometimes go too quickly or too nimbly, right? The famous lines from Federal 70 about energy and the executive, um, Hamilton writes that energy and the executive is important for among other things, steady administration of the laws, mm -hmm. right? Hamilton there and elsewhere, he did write some about steadiness in administration um, within the executive branch, not just in, in you know, legislatures and courts having their own kinds of steadiness, but the president would have an energy that would be applied steadily. And is there a risk that President Trump, if he changes too much or if he changes his mind too often, uh, would actually undermine that virtue of, of the constitutional president? That's, that's an excellent point. I think uh, what Hamilton's talking about there, I think was uh, the experience under the state constitutions where the executive is chosen by Congress, right? Where the executives were hand selected by the legislature and they were really more like prime ministers, if anything, or agents of Congress. And that uh, what they saw was, they would call it the mutability. Right? They saw right. flip-flopping changes because they associated that with the legislature. And so I quite agree that they wanted the executive to have a program. Remember Alexander Hamilton then comes in as the first treasury secretary. He's got these plans for this and this plan right. for that, which he then goes to Congress and persuades them Congress to enact. Uh, I think, I, I, so I quite agree with you. I do think that uh, Hamilton has in mind energy in the executive and part of that energy comes from having a vision and a program and implementing it over coursing. So it's not, I agree. So the president is not just like a whirling political dervish, just, you know, moving left and right in response to the latest political wind. So the next question from the audience comes from Connor Dixon. Connor writes, 
What powers does the president have today that you think are outside the founding vision? And, and he adds, uh, what are your thoughts on Trump's recent firing of several inspectors general? So why don't we start with the first question yeah. um, about the presidential powers today and the founder's vision of the presidency. I really think this power of non-enforcement, I call it, uh, is outside the founder's understanding of the office. Uh, and of course this was first, first uh, created, I think, by Barack Obama in the DACA program. Now, presidents have always had a right I think, to not enforce laws that they thought were unconstitutional. So I think Thomas Jefferson certainly has the right to come in upon assuming office and say, I'm not going to prosecute anybody under the Sedition Act anymore because I think it violates the free speech clause. And I'm going to pardon people who are convicted, even though the, even though the, not the, Supreme, but the lower courts and the Congress have passed the law and the president, John Adams, who signed it, thought it was constitutional. But I don't think presidents have this right that's been claimed recently to not enforce laws because you don't agree with the, he doesn't agree with the policy that Congress enacted. Right? So that's what the DACA program really was. I mean, the president said, I think we should be letting more people into the country. I think Congress's immigration laws are too harsh. Uh, Congress had studied actually passing a DACA program but just hadn't managed to get the votes. If you allow a president to be able to not enforce laws selectively then uh, A, you've given him a veto that can't be overridden by Congress. And second, you probably defeat congressional efforts to compromise about that issue and to pass legislation. Or if you do, it'll distort the legislation that's passed because you've always got the possibility the president might undo some kind of legislative deal by later coming on and say, well, I signed that bill, but I'm just not gonna enforce the law now because I just don't agree with it anymore. On this, this point about non-enforcement, I remember um, when President Obama was was announcing his DACA and then DAPA policies, you wrote on this in, a, in an article that you co-authored on the Take Care Clause, and you wrote quite a lot about the Take Care Clause. In fact, I think I even remember watching you present a version of that paper at AEI uh, many, many years ago. Um, Too long ago. Don't remind me. <laughs> but, but I'll say that's one of the great challenges then, right, is that this the president's ability, maybe his, it's, it's wrongful, but a president's ability to simply not enforce laws um, that's, it's hard to locate a, a, a proper constitutional check and balance within the system to counteract that. It ultimately comes down to questions of how an individual president limits his own ambition, right? He might hate a, a policy on policy grounds, not have a good constitutional argument against it. And, and he, he, he really is duty bound to, uh, to implement that policy. The question is whether he'll live up to that duty. Yeah, in fact, uh, this is one of my criticisms of impeachment. Uh, I think uh, using impeachment to go after the president of Ukraine is small potatoes. What the founders had in mind, actually, is something what you're talking about, Adam, and what the question suggests is if the president doesn't enforce the law, if the president actually goes beyond executive power, creates some kind of new non-enforcement power, then the only real check that the Congress has is to impeach them. And that's, I think, when you look at the founding debates, they talk about that. That's an example, I think, that they give in the founding of something that is impeachment worthy would be a president who right, doesn't take care that the laws are faithfully executed. Uh, and in fact, you think about this non-enforcement power it really would represent a huge shift, I think of legislative power almost over to the executive. But you're right, as short of impeachment, right? The courts have always said they won't hear cases saying, go prosecute that guy, <laughs> right? They, right? They won't avoid. And so it really does have to be, uh, Congress could always create more offices and fund more officers in those areas, but it's still the president who directs how the decisions are made to pick which cases and which, where to spend those resources. So you're, I agree with you, short of impeachment, the only kind of check that occurs is from within the executive branch, or as you pointed out, Adam, from future presidents. Yeah. Uh, and let's not forget the second half of Connor's question, uh, your thoughts on Trump's firing of Inspector General, Inspector yeah, General. Yeah, it's a great question. You know, I think it goes back again to this more fundamental philosophical dispute about how our government should run. Should it be under the political control of our elected representatives, the president and Congress, uh, and we hold them accountable for the performance of the agencies, or should we instead have this kind of you know, more, uh, I think, European model of administration where uh, you, it's very Wilsonian. You want to have technical experts, 
If you're going to have technical experts, you want to shield them from politics. You want to prevent them from being influenced by the elected uh, politicians. Um, you want to cross the separation of powers and create new kinds of creatures, new kinds of agencies with these kind of insulated powers. Uh, because why not let the branches experiment and come up with new things rather than being handicapped by this 18th century separation of powers? I and mean, that's sort of what Woodrow Wilson thought about the separation of powers. If you look at it from that perspective, right, the height of that vision is independent councils and inspector generals. Right? Someone, mm -hmm. the inspector general, someone who works in the executive branch, but their job is really to watch the executive branch from the inside and then report to Congress. Right? That really is an effort again, to overcome the separation of powers rather than are you talking about what you just talked about now, right? The traditional way that uh, the separation of powers would work is that it's Congress's job to ferret out waste and abuse uh, from executive functions, uh, executive management of programs. That's called oversight. Uh, you think about the independent counsel and inspector generals are kind of a way for Congress to offload this important responsibility onto other people onto these new kinds of entities. But really everything inspectors or generals do should be Congress's job and Congress is fully capable of doing it constitutionally. They just don't wanna do it politically because it's hard work and it's controversial and they don't wanna take the political accountability for it. Uh, our third question is from uh, Ryan Nabil and he asks, how do you think President Trump's approach to foreign policy might have long-term effects on constitutional norms and presidential power with regard to foreign policy and international law? These are subjects you've written on quite a lot over the years. Yeah, it's a great question. I, you know, I hadn't thought of it that way exactly. You know, I was talking, I was thinking in the book more of how does a president uh, achieve a foreign policy and how has Trump really tried to achieve his? Uh, it's an interesting question how whether Trump is gonna have a longer term effect on presidential power in foreign affairs and international law. Well, one thing you can see is he expresses this um, skepticism of international organizations. I mean, if, if anything, I think he's again, sort of returning us to this sort of classic 19th century idea of international politics, of nations uh, pursuing their, their rational self-interest, not really trying to create these sort of treaties that legislate for the world, and maybe being more suspicious of international bodies, like not just the United Nations, but NATO. And you could say, look, that uh, misses out on a lot of opportunities for cooperation. So I think one thing that would be interesting in a second term would be to see if President Trump can now start to build new forms of cooperating with other countries. Obviously with China, the United States needs allies, uh, including not just Japan and South Korea, the Philippines, Vietnam, Indonesia. These are some of these are countries, or India, countries that the United States has never had any really long-term alliance with. President Trump is suspicious of making these long-term commitments. Can he figure out a way using diplomacy and the commander in chief power to build these kinds of alliances uh, that are convenient for the issue of containing China, but aren't creating some vast new permanent bureaucracy either? I think that's going to be an interesting challenge because I think for the last 50 years, it's been seen as an either or kind of proposition. Either you're in favor of vast international organizations with a kind of universal legislative power, or you're just in favor, I guess, of returning to chaos and anarchy of the kind we used to see that produced World War I and World War II. And I think what the United States is trying to figure out which Trump uses constitutional powers to try to develop is something in between. Uh, I think that, and that, I think that would bring American means into line with its uh, ends, which is always the goal of strategy. Now we have a question from Tal Fortgang, research assistant here at AEI. Oh, uh, now we're going to the peanut gallery. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll, 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 I work with Tal and believe me, he's no peanut. Um, <laughs> what uh, He asks, how might Trump's presidency uh, help Congress to reassert its own power? Um, what, what could President Trump do to challenge Congress to be a better version of Congress? That's a, actually, it's a, uh, that's a great question because one thing you'd say is, look, President Trump has provoked Congress already into using uh, powers like impeachment, uh, like these oversight hearings that it may not necessarily have done with any other uh, president. But you know, Madison, and maybe Madison was wrong, but Madison would have expected 
that, you know, as the president does claim these greater powers, the president does um, push his agenda that it will naturally provoke Congress to reassert itself. Uh, the one thing I think he didn't anticipate, Madison didn't anticipate was that instead sometimes Congress would rather delegate that authority to agencies rather than to do it itself. Again, like we're saying the independent council or inspector generals or independent bodies and commission. You know, the interesting thing is the Supreme Court is steadily trying to prevent Congress from doing that, right? They've been on a, a mission of reducing the independence of some of these bodies um, like the CFPB, oh, excuse me, sorry. <laughs> like the CFPB or uh, the Pickaboo or something like that, maybe we're going to see a court that ultimately says we're not gonna have independent commissions and bodies. And that ultimately might lead Congress to do its job too. Yeah. Uh, John, a, a little while ago, you talked about uh, you know, President Trump, uh, the risk of, of, of sometimes going a bit overboard. Jeez. Um, that's actually Sorry. the CFPB. That's the CFPB calling. <laughs> um, no, it's or the Chinese Communist Party. Yeah. Well, there's a, as with President Trump, as we said, he's been a very energetic president, and um, sometimes stakes out a pretty aggressive position, right, and, and then falls back to a, a more of a negotiating position. With both the presidency, Congress, there's always a risk that that overreach will undermine the office. This is a point you touch on in the book. Um, both with Congress and the House, I mean, and its approach to impeachment. Um, within the executive branch, you hearken back to President Nixon uh, and, and the fact that you know, some of his own assertions of power um, undermined the office in, in the 1970s with the backlash of legislation and, and skepticism of presidential power. How can President Trump make sure to, 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 to defend the Constitution while not a pushing his power so aggressively that he actually undermines the office. I mean, after all, the yeah, saying goes, discretion is, some, is the better part of valor. It's a great question. So it's a great way to you know, come to the end of the hour. Was, yeah. uh, that was a subject that I've, I've thought a lot about in my, uh, unfortunately, decades studying the presidency. And I thought, right, the, a lot of the president's powers really depend on the circumstances, right? They really do depend, uh, that there really be an emergency or an attack or a war to justify the expanded powers a president can exercise under the commander in chief power. Uh, and you don't want uh, someone claiming the powers of Lincoln during a time, during a peacetime. And I think that in a way was Nixon's mistake was that you, you allude to Nixon. He tried to claim the sort of presidential wartime powers, uh, but turned them on his domestic enemies. And there was no real domestic turmoil and threat uh, that justified that kind of power that a kind of a Lincoln or an FDR would have claimed. And it's, it's, I don't think the constitution can save us on that. I think that really is what um, defines the great presidents and the better presidents from the poor ones is this being able to adapt the powers to the right circumstances uh, and not mistaking peacetime for an emergency, but also, and this reminds me of James Buchanan, the president right before Lincoln, also not realizing there really is chaos and an emergency and that presidential power really ought to be expanded. But I think that's really an issue of uh, judgment, not really constitutional law. Sorry about that. That's okay. Well, thanks, John, for your time. Uh, again, we've been discussing John Yu's new book, Defender in Chief, Donald Trump's Fight for Presidential Power. Uh, John, thanks for joining us. Thank you, Adam. And thanks to AI. Thanks, everybody, for those great questions and taking a look at the book. I really appreciate it. Right. And thanks to everybody who joined us today and sent in questions uh, in these times when we're all socially distanced. Please keep an eye on AEI's website for lists of upcoming events like these on the Constitution and on all the other subjects that AEI's scholars cover. Um, but that will be the end of this event. Thanks for joining us. Thank you, everybody. <laughs>